Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Sunrise Daily. I'm Chamberlain Uso. Good morning. I'm Ayo Makinde. Welcome to the show. And from Abuja, good morning. I'm Maupe Ogun Yusuf. Yeah, so the NCDC had their briefing yesterday after they, uh, they, they had that their session where they said they had to review what had been going on. But yes, uh, the figures were also out yesterday. 595 cases, uh, confirmed cases, new confirmed cases by the NCDC in the country compared to the previous 571. So it's 24 more higher than the previous ones. And there you go. Uh, that's what you get to see there. But um, new concerns, as perhaps many may have observed worldwide, as a matter of fact, because some new information just coming through just raises a lot more concern. Look, much as some other countries are trying to see how they can reimpose a lockdown, even countries who said, perish the thought <laughs> that wasn't going to happen. But, you know, it's new, uh, novel coronavirus. And that's why sometimes you just can never make categorical statements about some of these things. Even scientists have said, look, in the event where we do, well, we just had to come back and say, well, look, this is the new information we have. Uh, so you may have to have a shift of mindset and focus from the previous information, maybe unlearn some of those things or information that you had previously. And one that a big concern turns out that, um, look, there was a report in China. And then they said um, even people who were seated beyond six meters apart, it turns out that they captured it. So one new confirm. Uh, Debates going on out there trying to find out if it's the case is whether or not this COVID-19 is airborne. Gosh, that, that is huge. You just wonder, goodness, how do we just approach this? Particularly in the light of World Bank's new comments that look, many governments are headed in the wrong direction. If we don't focus on the right things about COVID, because look, you may be tired of COVID. COVID is not tired <laughs> of people. And the thing is, is that, um, look, the nature of the virus is that, just one simple thing, it's just looking for who next to infect. Hence, that should inform most, if you not know, key actions that governments take. Look, the economics and all of those things will come to play eventually, but boy, we just need to keep thinking about how are we approaching this? We evaluate our steps, the processes we've taken before. Can we afford to drop our guard and go as if it's business as usual? Who knows? Well, Everyone is uh, evolving, just as you said. It's a new, you know, virus. So everyone seems to be coming up with different ideas of how to go about this as safely as they can. To oh, date, scientific ideas, though. <laughs> yeah. Till date, there are still people who do not believe that there is anything as COVID-19, and that is sad and painful. Despite every effort that you know the media is, you know, shouting itself hoarse, the federal government at the uh, doing whatever they all can, also can, Ministry of Health, all health workers are stretched thing. But then there's one thing that, you know, government has repeatedly stressed, and that is the use of non-pharmaceutical stuff, such as face masks and face shields. Some have decided, you know what, it's very inconvenient and they're disconcerting to wear the face mask. Why don't I just wear a face shield? Maybe that would suffice. But there, it, it perhaps also buttresses what uh, Chamberlain mentioned about whether or not, you know, this uh, virus is airborne. There are what they call droplets. And it, what is funny is that the droplets have different weight sizes. So if it's in a humid, it's a, if it's in an enclosure, which is one of the reasons that government keeps saying, don't let's open, you know, churches and restaurants now because they are enclosed places. And enclosed, in enclosed places, the aerosols live a little longer in the air, you know, and they, they are closer to people and stuff, So, which also buttresses what you t said about what happened in China. So this is one of the reasons. And is it safe to wear only a face shield? No, because while the face shield can do what it can to pr protect your, your eyes, how about your nose and your masks? Your eyes don't suck air, but your mouth does when you talk, and your, your nose does when you talk. So those are the things that I think we all should, so should pay a lot of attention to. So face Face masks are a compulsory thing as much as possible. Yes, so the, that is. alone. Yes, cannot. No, 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 no. And then all, all kinds of talks, you know, all over the place. From what, if you can, please do go ahead and search out what the World Health Organization has said. More than two hundred and thirty thousand cases within a very, very short time, maybe a day or a week, and that is something that you know cannot even be 
be, be, you know, be, 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 be part, part, part of what I think we also need to focus on simultaneously while talking about how we need to be a lot more concerned and yeah. conduct ourselves better, better is that what treatment protocol I mean, mm. if for those who have, uh, who contracted it, who survived, yeah. we need to listen to them a lot more as well. They need yeah. to talk about, look, in the event that the preventive measures don't mm. work, because don't forget, there are people, I think, is it, was it the mayor of New York or something, who said, look, we were in our houses. Mm. We didn't step out. And we contracted. Which is, which under, underscores this aerosol, the weight of the aerosol. The, the, wow. the interesting thing about this thing is, the aerosols that carry the virus itself, they come in different sizes. The lighter ones will go farther than the heavier ones. It's, you know, it's just, you know, simple. But the question is about Nigeria's health system. Having understood the challenge that we face, what measures are we putting in place to ensure that, look, we can handle certain situations better than when COVID-19 caught us, as it caught other countries unaware? The truth of the matter is, Chamberlain, we cannot take anymore we shouldn't allow ourselves to be more. vulnerable to take more than <laughs> we already have in Lagos alone, oh, like, there are about 10,000 cases that are alive is, we will have to take we will have to take it but which is why we need to underscore repeatedly the need for people to take responsibility every one of us needs to play our own part and that is what is very very important here Malque. What more is that to say? You know, it was just yesterday that I decided to pay attention again to the news on coronavirus. It is exhausting, and that's the truth. And so I can understand, you know, if people are showing some sort of fatigue uh, in terms of, you know, how they conduct themselves or even about news concerning coronavirus. It's now been here for, what now, six months, thereabout. Uh, and it would seem that gradually we're learning to live with it. Uh, those who know that they are vulnerable know that they should take extra precautions. So the question is, what else is there to know? I mean, the people who are refusing to uh, adhere to, you know, to rules or take precautions, uh, you know, they know the risks that they are taking. They are not, they are not strangers to it. And maybe they don't. Maybe in some places they don't. But I, I must applaud certain states. So yesterday, it also came out that some states are also being, uh, they're now imposing rules, imp imposing some form of uh, uh, regulation, enforcement uh, for, for people to, in their states to wear masks. When they see that the cases are rising, their health facilities are being stretched. And simple things that people can do, such as just wear a mask or and wash your hands as frequently as possible, people are not adhering to it. Then it's high time you now begin to, you know, put out some form of enforcement. Uh, but even with that, we have, we have seen that we have to be careful. Don't forget that only a few days ago, we recorded a death in Imo State, uh, which was supposed to be as a result of, you know, some policeman trying to enforce something, and then he killed the person as a result. Corona did not kill the person. The policeman who was trying to enforce, you know, safety rules was the one who killed him. So I, I know that, you know, some precautions need to be held there. So I think it's left for state authorities to keep monitoring what is going on and applying uh, pressure as appropriately, uh, appropriately as possible, you know, for people to continue to follow follow the, the guidelines. And by also uh, looking at what our correspondent sent in, it looked like there was some level of high information enforcement, uh, not just enforcement now, but adherence by the people themselves. A number of people we spoke to seemed to understand that it was for their own good, that this was not about government, this was for them. Even though some people claim that, you know, it made it more difficult to identify criminals and that uh, criminals could start operating underneath all of this. Well, hey, we will be safe first before, you know, we now begin to think about, uh, you know, criminals. So, uh, for me, I would say that we should not, even if you think you know all there is to know about coronavirus, don't let your guard down. Don't. Yes, it is tiring. There is something called fatigue in all of this, and it's something that scientists acknowledge. Nonetheless, when you see that that is happening, then you must find ways to ensure that this just becomes a part of you. This is a part of your life. It's a part of who you are. So that even when corona goes, for instance, 
before now, even before Corona, the Corona pandemic, I, I li like to wash my hands as frequently as possible. I've had a baby and normally when people come to my house, I would not have you come into my house until you washed your hands and taken off your shoes. You know, so some things just will have to stay with us as we move along. I'm hoping that all the public health facilities which we are upgrading, uh, some of the precautions which we are taking before you enter in closed spaces, wash your hands, that those things will not leave us as coronavirus leaves us. That those things are here to stay as a public health measure. Uh, and I think that's a sad thing that happened when, you know, Ebola came so quickly and left. But perhaps because this one is staying a little longer, we will imbibe the lessons for a bit longer. And um, who knows, it might be a part of us. It might become routine for us uh, before this virus eventually leaves us. If that alone is what we are able to do, I think that the virus would have served its purpose. Gentlemen. Mm. What a big ask. Uh, the measures, the strategies that we should take, suggested we take. But let's see how the dailies reflect this in a moment. Some of the dailies, uh, take a look at Nigerian Tribune first. All Nigerians should get tested for COVID-19. PTF. So, if you had thought, nah, don't worry about that. How about this? <laughs> how are you going to handle this one now? And then look at that, uh, the writers, gives new guidelines for schools reopening, wants government meetings virtual till further notice. I remember when they were asking him about that and uh, well, he said, look, that should be the way, uh, could be new normal. Uh, everyone, no point asking to see how you can make uh, internet what, cheaper. Mm. Maybe should the alternative world be affordable? And the SGF give examples, and I thought, but Mr. SGF, those examples are elitist examples. So for those up there, because I mean, look at when the banks opened. Did you see how many people were there? Contrary to what many had thought, even though they say they saw it coming, but I don't know if they did because by the actions they carried out, you not question if at all they really did see it coming. After all, even some of the services you provided, it's throttled sometimes. <laughs> so, but. An argument that is out there. Uh, the other writers, FG's decision on mask, as the, yeah, not binding on states. Whoa, how is this going to happen? Perhaps this describes to the minister now. Mm, yeah, perhaps because you know the state government controls certain levels of. Um, Granted, of but in this event, how should it be happen? Should it still be this way? Well, we'll find out soon. Uh, 35 doctors have tested positive in Quara, as described to the NMA. 12 deaths recorded in Lagos within 24 hours. And you know, I hope they also, I think, this, did they speak about that? Where if you get to the hospital now, uh, they ask you for a COVID certificate or something like that before they attend to you. Because if you don't have it, they don't attend to you. Which also underscores the main headline. Um, how mo if all Nigerians are going to get tested can for COVID-19, can all Nigerians get tested for COVID-19 too? How much? At whose cost? Well, what's our testing capacity in the first instance? So how do you predicate this, this, this comment? Well, right? so it's a, he, he used the word should, so it's not much. Okay, so uh, I guess that's <laughs> the what? Uh, operational, instructive? Yeah. Okay. Well, look at this at the bottom strip as well. Alleged 70.849 billion naira NDDC contract scam. Reps want ex commissioners, directors, contractors to appear. Okay, so thereafter, what next? So what about the anti grab agency? Oh, the anti grab agency itself is ha it has some things to grapple with. So there you go. I guess um, a pause these days. The image you see there though, a cross-section of de-radicalized repentant Boko Haram members who have learned new skills at Malam City Camp in Gombe on Monday. Look, there are many questions about this de-radicalization of some of these members, but I wonder how it happens, what role state governments play. And okay. which of the governments, the federal or the states? You know, that, that question also came up, you know, I think it was last year we were discussing where we were talking about the de-radicalized terrorists mm -hmm. being released into the community. And then we were asking the question, did they go through a police, a police uh, system? Did they go through any documentation? You know? Speaking about the police, AFCC employees want use of police officer 
as chairman discontinued, uh, as Mago Probe continues in Asso Rock. Who will listen to them? Well, yes, yeah, someone has to listen to them because the law doesn't say police, it says security agencies. So, yep, check that out. The Daily Trust newspaper is next and it leads with the same COVID-19 story. FG scrambles for oxygen as COVID-19 deaths rise. Oxygen. Yeah, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Uh, you know, the PTF chairman yesterday was saying, look, we thought all we needed were respirators. Now we rec realize that we need more oxygen. <laughs> well, with the face mask, it won't make getting oxygen any easier, though. <laughs> so, for uh, riders, there are 70 people die in one week. That is definitely not good news. Oh, and it's yeah. something that should, you know, really ship us all up. Nigeria needs 10,000 respirators. That's according to experts. Coronavirus now airborne. Whoa. Categorically. That's according to the PTF. It's right there on the front page. Um, 34 doctors infected in Quara. That story is on page 5. I think the Amnesty International also raised an alarm about the number of um, medical practitioners all over the world that are being infected by this. It's something that should give us concern. That same picture of de-radicalized, repentant Boko Haram members right there on the front page. Above the nameplate, Two stories right beside each other. WASC, we can't decide for private state schools. That's according to the federal government. You'll find that story on page three. And right beside that one, economists seek bailout for private schools. Oh. Yeah, the um, Minister of State had talked about that, I think it was April or between April, May, and June, that look, private schools should approach the CBN, which because private schools, according to him, fell under the MSMEs, which the federal, the, which the CBN has a preparation for. So maybe that will also help. Right under the picture, you find CBN directs dealers to ex to exclude maize from forex list. So people actually import maize into Nigeria. Hmm. Import more than that. Yeah. All right, that's uh, on page 16. Let's leave it there for the Daily Trust. Banga Newspapers is next now. Looking at the lead headline, day six. Panel quizzes Magu on 700 million Naira training fund. Panel orders Magu's offices in Abuja, Lagos, locked up. 18 of his aides also locked out of their offices. Three bulletproof SUVs recovered from him. Panel arrests operatives, seizes computers. It's on page five of the paper. Uh, you find all the stories uh, right there. And you also see there, World Trade Center, Abuja on fire. Yes, that happened yesterday and was caught by a number of people uh, who are around that particular area. You see the picture right there on the front page of the Vanguard. Other stories you see there, NDDC, Akpabio, Joy Nune in War of Dirty Wards. Bandits kill 24, burn houses in Kaduna. That's also there. And unclaimed dividends rises by 32% to 158.4 billion naira. Who are these investors who are just leaving their dividends unclaimed? Who knows? Maybe I'm one of them. <laughs> well, page 20 will give you all the details. Uh, that's money that should be in some, but in some people's accounts. I look in there. COVID-19, federal government unveils 52-page guidelines for schools reopening, kidnapping, court admits six guns recovered from Madume into evidence. That's also there as well. You have a number of other stories uh, on the corner. PNID, Nigeria seeks more time to appeal $9.6 billion award. Mr. and Mrs. is there for you. Um, <laughs> what's Mrs. saying this morning? I barely can see it, but... Uh, uh, Mrs. is saying, I heard about you and a strange woman. Is she prettier than me? Well endowed at the rear and front with charming smile, light skin, tall with hourglass shape. Well, <laughs> Mr. says, congratulations. You know your husband very well. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what that means, but you might want to look inside the paper. Maybe there'll be more explanation there. Uh, looking at sports, Vanguard Sports on the back page, Eagles must step up to a culture canoe level, says Osime. It's on the back page of the paper. Yes, we've had some fantastic footballers uh, in times past, and we, of course, we need to see new stars at that particular level. Let's leave it there for Vanguard newspapers.
Okay, then take a look at uh, The Guardian next. Uh, 200 billion naira investments test Ogun. Lagos infrastructure. Completely different trajectory, isn't it? Uh, but the writers states jostle for investor confidence, bad roads, vehicle repairs, raise cost of operations, <laughs> investors rule charges, failed infrastructure. Government should embrace PPP. So you might just want to go ahead. Uh, and see that. And then they also do have worst child illiteracy looms in Nigeria, others over COVID 19. Virus creates $6.2 billion education spending gap in sub Saharan Africa. Experts fear imminent surge in infant maternal mortalities. Uh, don't forget all those millions of children who are out of school, according to several reports. So, how does this impact on those figures? How are the considerations we should be given moving forward, I reckon? So that, that's equally huge there. Anxiety as fresh crisis erupts in Unilag. Yeah, you might want to find out what is that about? Yeah, you should read it. And they also have a bit of Magu. Magu faces salami panel as senior lawyers seek his release and magu methodology that's what's on the back page oh it's all over the place now about mm -hmm. this day six and the panel continuing its work that's the guardian this morning well the attention of the daily times newspaper is on revocation of land titles looms in fct mm -hmm. what that means well if you have a property we want to check it out stories on page two that picture is also there of the radicalized boko haram members under that one, three stories, Amnesty International raises the alarm over a death of 3,000 health workers. Definitely something disconcerting. Corruption. PDP asks Aquabio to step aside for probe. And on COVID-19, federal government issues rules for meetings, reopening of schools. That's um, right there on the front page. Uh, the editorial of the Daily Times is signed posted right above the nameplate. Stopping the rip epidemic. Definitely something you may want to take a look at. That's the Daily Times newspaper this morning. Halfway. Leadership. Yeah, leadership has this one. Coronavirus grounds activities in government houses. Some government offices remain shut. No hope of return to normalcy anytime soon. That's according to WHO. Rising cases due to denial, delay in seeking help. That's according to the federal government. Releases new guidelines for reopening of schools. Nigeria records 3,600 rape cases during lockdown. That is certainly of epidemic proportions. Uh, we can't rule out airborne transmission of virus, is according to the NCDC. That story is there uh, for you as well. Mago fights back, says recovered loot don't generate interest um, as panel grills EFCC secretary directors. Again, a number of other stories there. Passengers to now arrive airports one hour, 30 minutes before takeoff. So if you really want Members of the Presidential Task Force on COVID-19 return from the mid-term review of the activities since the last three months of its inauguration as they brief on their new findings. Both the chairman of the Presidential Task Force on COVID-19 and the Minister of Health expressed concern about the rising number of fatalities recorded in Nigeria in the last one week. 13,447 COVID-19 cases have so far been treated and successfully discharged in Nigeria. And we have regrettably recorded 740 fatalities on the whole. Our aim is to further reduce the fatalities. The rising fatalities in Nigeria is not unconnected 
with denial and delay in seeking help. The last week recorded the highest weekly fatality of 70 deaths. From 645 fatalities reported as at July the 5th, the number of COVID-19 related deaths rose to 740 as at Sunday, July 12th. The number of confirmed cases also rose from 28,711 to 32,558 during the same period. The Director General of the Nigeria Center for Disease Control informs the gathering about a recent finding on the mode of transmitting the virus. Over the past few weeks, increasing evidence has emerged that in addition to droplet infection, we cannot rule out that airborne transmission is also possible with, as a mode of transmission of COVID-19. And WHO has released new, uh, updated its guidelines on this, saying exactly the same thing. The PTF chairman also highlights what must be done to reduce infections and death. The PTF wishes to reiterate the following. All government offices shall continue to hold virtual meetings in their offices, especially where participants exceed four persons, and they should also suspend unnecessary travels for meetings. I must not close without reiterating the need for all of us to remain conscious of the fight before us. The pandemic would not go away by wishing Neither would it go away if we refuse to keep safe. Please, let's all resolve to play our part. The World Health Organization had in the past commended the Nigerian government's response to COVID-19, especially as fatality rates remain very low compared with some countries in the region. However, the recent surge in the number of deaths and confirmed cases should be a cause of concern, not only for the government, but also for individuals who may have lowered their guards. All right, welcome back. So we'll take a look at some of those provisions. Uh, we've got... Uh, uh, Dimala Abbas here with us. He's a professor of international law and uh, global affairs expert. Thank you for coming on this morning, sir. My pleasure. Well, having listened to that briefing, uh, at least summarized the version of that, and let's start from the perspective of the education component before we look at some of the other provisions which they talked about. Well, it, it's still out there being talked about. Yes, they, 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 in part of that uh, protocol, they talked about the phased reopening of schools, whatever things. All those arguments went back and forth. They've since gone back. The Minister of Education particularly now saying, well, he doesn't think he's safe. And that, um, look, but at the moment, that decision itself, was it part of what you had requested holistically? And did it meet some of the expectations that perhaps you had concerning schools reopening? Well, thank you very much. Uh, thanks for having me, uh, Chamberlain and Ayo. Um, I recall about two weeks ago, I think, uh, we had this uh, uh, discussion. And I think one of the things that came from that uh, uh, session was the need for the federal government to think very deeply before throwing our schools open. And the argument at that point in time was not that we should not open our schools at all or we should wait to die or we should wait forever until uh, the pandemic ends. But we were thinking about what safe reopening actually was supposed to mean then. And I'm, I'm very glad that about a, a few days later, about a week later, the federal government uh, uh, retraced its step and said it would not reopen the school that they were not. Uh, but as we said yesterday, I think they came up with these guidelines uh, a couple of days ago. Uh, I don't know whether you've seen the guidelines, about 52 pages long, which yeah. I've had the opportunity to read through. Yeah. And it's interesting that the, uh, uh, the positions of the federal government actually reflect substantially some of the things that the panelists brought out about two weeks ago. That is to say uh, that what I, for, for, what I first found interesting was the principles for the guideline itself. Don't let's forget that. They talk about engaging a wide variety of stakeholders, very, very important. But what I found glad was that the federal government talked about uh, responsibility to people who are going to school. That is extremely important to bear in mind. Then they talk about building 
better back. That is building the facilities of those schools uh, better back and so on and so forth. Then they then went into uh, what should be done before schools will reopen at all. And they identify some core issues mm -hmm. that number one, there must be a consideration of what is the rate of communal or community transmission, transmission yeah. across the country as a whole. Number two, what is the level of testing that is available at the moment? Number three, what is the capacity of schools to be able to comply with all those measures that is sanitization and this and that? Safety stance and so on. And then also about number four, that schools must look into the how the schools transport their population, you know, back and forth and health facilities and so on. About six different things, which I think are very, very fundamental. I think that is important. And I'm very glad that the federal government has taken that step. You know, you know but as much as those provisions may have been spelt out, those provisions, I mean, some of those highlights, they've always been a challenge, even pre-COVID. Mm -hmm. So did you think that that was ever going to be fulfilled? Before they open the schools? And to be honest with you, uh, not necessarily so. What do I mean by that? You know, when, when two weeks ago we talked about the extension and the, the, that the federal government should not make a mistake of, you know, focusing on the distinction between the private and the public schools mm -hmm. when you want to apply these measures. And you see, uh, private school proprietors, the NAPPS, have been pushing voraciously for the past two days now, that the federal government must allow private schools to reopen on the basis that private schools are able to comply with all those protocols. But your question actually has also much more to do with public schools, which will never have the resources. And I think we made a point two weeks ago that, look, public schools are largely the responsibility of government itself to maintain, unlike private school. If anybody is paying millions of naira on a kindergarten to be in private school, they wouldn't have a problem paying 50,000 naira, 100,000 naira to ensure that their kids in school you know, have all those facilities. So the federal government can simply not say, well, we've, we've got these measures, which is a start-off point, that let's have clear measures. Then the question now is, how will those measures be fulfilled? I'm sorry to jump in again. When those private schools were asking that government allow private schools to open because they say that they can meet up with mm -hmm. these measures. What do you then say to those who think that, wait a minute, they don't think that that is the sole purpose. This has also got to do with revenue here because some of the private school teachers have not been paid for a long while. Isn't that some of the chief considerations as well? It is, no doubt about that. And that is my position, that look, we cannot begin to fractionalize our system. We cannot be saying that we have some measures that will only apply to private schools uh, because they have the resources to be able to, and they will not apply to public school. It wouldn't, and it's in, this thing has been carried on to the question of why, whether, whether why, you mm. know, should be written. Um, private schools are saying, look, our kids are ready to write <laughs> why. We want them to go back. Uh, the federal government has no business. And in fact, it's today they are going to be making their case to the federal government yeah. to ensure that private school students are able to write why. Look, nobody is against the private school here. Let's get, let's get them clear. But what we are saying is that WAEC is a responsibility of the federal government at the end of the day. It's Nigeria that is a member of WAEC. So the federal government cannot begin to prevail, you know, over what you can call a fractionalization of its own system by saying, oh, I will allow private schools because they can afford it and they are ready to go and write WAEC. But public schools, you are damned. You but is, is the same federal government that said in the papers this morning that they do not have um, jurisdiction over <laughs> schools in states? Ayo, that is a very very laughable, as far as I'm concerned, uh, stands by the federal government. I understand, constitutionally, education is on the concurrent list in the constitution, which means both the federal government and the state can legislate. So let's get that one right. It is within the constitutional right of every state in Nigeria to legislate on its own education, primary, secondary, and some tertiary institution. Mm. However, here is a catch. If the government is now washing its hands of that responsibility, the responsibility of federal government is not to federal or state control schools is to Nigerian students as a whole, whether you are federal or you are state. And here is the thing, I'm going to throw a spoiler here. Look at the US. The federal government in the US is saying school must reopen. Mm -hmm. States are saying, no, we are not ready for it. Mm -hmm. Don't forget, Trump threatened a couple of days ago with Davos, the Secretary of Education, that they would defund, you know, if schools do not reopen. Of course, they can't do that because you have to go back to the Congress and for that program. But here, the converse is the case. You know, the federal government is saying open, the states are saying we're not open. So what we are seeing is an interplay between the federal and state authorities. I have a solution to that, to be honest with you. It's very simple. 
Why I sympathize with private school, don't get me wrong. The federal government has a state responsibility to protect all Nigerian students, all Nigerians as a whole. So if a state is going to be, let me say, rascally, or say, well, because of the Constitution, we have a right to open, the federal government can impose, permit me to say, a state of emergency. It might look oh. laughable. Make no mistake, Section 305 of the Constitution, Subsection 2, Paragraph E and F specifically talks about if there is any occurrence in the country that constitutes a natural calamity or disaster, yeah. which obviously covers pandemic, mm -hmm. the federal government can declare state so of emergency. So why then hasn't the federal government declared a state of emergency? It's a billion, it's a billion dollar question. All right. Well, gentlemen, let's bring in Mrs. Lai Koiki. She is the chairman of uh, Association of Private Educators in Nigeria. She joins us via Zoom. Good morning, and thank you for joining us today. What do you make of this conversation about schools, private schools, wanting to reopen vis-a-vis -vis the situation with the public schools as well? Well, basically, I mean, private schools would like to reopen, I mean, simply because they're interested in the welfare or well-being of our children. And we're trying to avoid um, learning gaps and all of that. And so, but then reopening does not necessarily mean um, reopening on site, if that is clear. Okay, could, could you share some light in terms of how are they going to operationalize that? Well, already, I mean, um, most of the students in private schools are already learning online. And so, and that has been quite effective over the period. Remember that we also have, just as the earlier speaker has said, government has the responsibility, the federal government has the responsibility of the, to see to the well-being of all Nigerian students. So also do proprietors of private schools, and I would, I dare say, public schools too, should, you know, have the interest and well-being and safety of all students in mind. And so um, asking that schools should reopen, yeah, while it is good to reopen on site, we must fundamentally ensure that it is safe for students to be on site. And for that to happen, there are just too many variables that we cannot control. They can't be controlled. Yes, it's good to have the hand sanitizers and the... Um, um, washing bays and all of hand washing bays. But I mean, the level of testing is still so low. Before you open schools, are we going to test all our teachers? Are we going to test all the students before they come in to ensure that there's, there's nobody I mean, with the virus? Remember that most of these young people are asymptomatic. And so what happens? And so there's just so much. Yes, we've put in a whole lot of arrangements um, ensuring that you know, children will remain in um, social bubbles. They don't mix, you know, one class to the other and all of that. You can put all of that in place. But how do you ensure when there's the level of testing itself is abysmally low? It is quite challenging. In other words, you do not subscribe to on-site reopening of private schools. I am not sure that we are actually quite ready for that with the increase in um in cases and the i mean inadequacy of, of testing i would not subscribe to it so what then do you make of the uh, advocacy by you know private school operators and some according well some other parent teachers um, um associations clamoring for schools to reopen well i mean you know in the world or in the society there's so many different views. So many, I mean, as many people as you have, you probably would have as many views. But what is fundamental? The well-being of the students is fundamental. The well-being of our society is fundamental. And so, I mean, could we prevail, for instance, on um, WAEC, talking about WAEC now, could we prevail on them to have another season of examinations? Could we prevail on them? I mean, I mean, this even allows us to look at some fundamental issues within our system. Those fundamental issues such as, I mean, for instance, I mean, you have the external examinations who quickly changed that, okay, we don't need to have on-site examinations. 
this year because of the peculiarity. We are going to do a level of assessment. We are going to use continuous assessment to grade the children this year so that students don't have to be exposed to the challenges of this time, you know? And so that has happened with some external um, examining bodies. Now, if that is not possible within our own system, it sort of challenges the fundamentals, even of education. What are we doing? I mean, this is for me a wake up call to rejig quite a lot of things within the educational system. Hmm. Well, um, Professor Abbas, one of the things that's said in that, um, I don't know if you want to react to that one first. Go ahead. Yeah, I would, I would like to react. I think uh, I agree almost entirely with what uh, uh, the woman just said. Uh, on site and for YA? Yeah, well, to some extent, I'll clarify. For on site, I think okay. uh, we're not quite there because of the uh, amount of logistical uh, uh, things that we require. Section 305, notwithstanding. <coughs> notwithstanding the section. No, you notwithstanding, notwithstanding the section. Uh, the, the section I brought in the section in terms of that is a is, is the end game is a worst case scenario. Look, a state of emergency is not something you declare. You, it's not a walk in the park. It's not something you declare off the cuff. But I'm saying as an example, because whether we like it, there's a, there's there's a, there's there's a tension here, or there could be tension mm -hmm. along the line between the federal government and, and the, the state, state government. Governments. The federal government is very strongly convinced today that these schools cannot be opened except ABC are done. But some states, like your state has already opened anyway, some states are saying, we, where is our right to open? Mm -hmm. It is their right to open. But I'm saying because of the responsibility of the government, federal government, towards every Nigerian child, mm -hmm. then the question is, how do you resolve the constitutional logjam if it continues? Okay. The simple thing is, declare a state of emergency to make sure you're able to tell the state, you know what is your right, but I have the over overarching authority mm -hmm. to do that under the constitution. The okay. constitution is a grand norm. Mm -hmm. So let's, let's, let's clear up. Then for Waiek as an example, yeah. I listened to her when she was saying that hey, uh, maybe Waiek will have a rethink and this and that. Look, let's get something clear. Waiek was established in 1951 before Nigeria got independence. As a British West African uh, phenomenon among Nigeria, Ghana, Gambia, and Syria alone, primarily to bring standards among West African students who are going to study in the UK mm -hmm. at that point in time. It wasn't until 1982 that a convention was adopted in Liberia during the 30th anniversary of Waiek, which was ratified two years in 1984. It was upon the ratification of that convention in 1984 that WAG became an international organization. Let's get it clear. Mm -hmm. Now, under international law, an international organization cannot be more powerful than your member states. So if a member state says, I am not ready to do this, you can't jump and say you are going to fix a date that you want to do that anyway. That is poking your finger in the eyes of your member state. That, that's a different... You Which know, are the funders of the body anyway. Precisely. Which are the funders of the... Just like the EU. Most of the rules are based on consensus. So you must have 20, now 27 member states saying yes before you can do anything. You know, so let's get that one clear. WIKE cannot just go on a call. And I was happy that yesterday, WIKE, in response to what the federal government, WIKE was saying, they will review. You know, so I think somebody must have told them that what you are doing is you're pushing, yeah. you're putting the because card before the horse. The minister, minister of education, at the time he made that announcement, he, he appeared irked by what was going on. Because in that statement, he was talking about how conversation was going on and before you knew what was happening why I was saying that they were going to they announced they were going to open so says, okay you know what no this is not going to happen so what wonders then uh if but in that same breath he was appealing to private schools and to states saying look schools under the ministry uh, supervision of the ministry of education will not but he then appealed to all mm. the others to follow suit so in the event that they feel well, Mr. Minister, we hear you, but uh, no thanks. What happens? Well, two, two approaches. I've already talked about one. If the federal government will go that, that route, that is a route of emergency, which I don't think they will do anyway. The second route is very simple. You know, okay, you want to go and write, you want to go open your school, private school, go and open them. I control WAIC. I'm the country. Uh, uh, but NECO. Oh, NECO. Well, <laughs> NECO, NECO is national. Yeah. But I'm talking about WAIC now, mm -hmm. as an example. And I'm saying, you know what, I'm not going to present any candidate, whether you are private or public. But we shouldn't get to that level at all. That is the sensibility here. Mm -hmm. Number one, I think there should be a discussion between WIAC member states and WIAC itself. Once you resolve that at that level, it will trickle down to whether you are public or private school okay. at the end of the day. Well, there are two issues uh, that come to play. But maybe we take it one after the other. The first is the, 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 the frustration mm -hmm. 
and the tension in homes because of students that That's are right. at home. Mm -hmm. um, how do you suggest that be addressed if schools do not reopen soon? Well, I, I wish I had a crystal ball to just gaze in and give you a straightforward answer. But look, <clears throat> I schooled in this country. I was in the university in the 80s and 90s. We lost, sometimes we lost one session, two sessions to military dictators just shutting down the schools. We're not even talking about our life being threatened here. Mm. Just somebody decided that I'm tired of this student. I want to close the school for one year. Somehow we survived, you know, in, in a way. Uh, and you're talking about a generation where you didn't have social media as such. Mm. Today, today's youth actually could better engage their time using social media as a powerful weapon. They could learn trading. They could learn different things that we were not opportuned in our own time to learn. Don't let's, let's put everything in context of what is going on, of this pandemic. I think the, the, the tendency, the way I see it, I could be wrong, but the tendency is that we seem to think only one aspect of the population will feel the impact of this pandemic. Others will be shielded from it. Look, whether you are a one-year-old or a hundred-year-old, you are going to feel the impact one way or the other. So as parents, what do we do? is to make sure we let our students, our children understand that it is not fault of, through the fault of their own, that they are not going to, they are, they are likely to miss school for six months or for one year. Because we'll, I'll be, let them even say, we push them, we rush them through schools today. We rush them through work. The question is, where are they going to go? You finish your work or your NECO, your essay, where do you want to go? In Nigeria, universities are not open. Overseas, let's say in Europe, Nigeria has been banned. Nigeria cannot fly to Europe today. I'm sure you are aware of that. Mm. You know, because of we are not on the list of those 14 countries allowed to fly to Europe. So for Nigerians who rush through their work, whatever they want to rush through, they can't study in Europe anyway. You but won't be able to go until they, they open they the They can university. make it online. <laughs> right. Precisely. So online, even in the U.S., and don't forget, even Trump administration is trying to repatriate internationals back to their country on the basis that they can do online in their country. And some states are fighting in there, saying, no, Precisely. we can't allow you to have yeah. Mr. President. But Mrs. Kweki... In terms of standardization of this entire process, if private schools want to go one way, what, what if the ministry then says, well, look, in, in that context, uh, context of the whole, because the country has to have a standard, and, and they say, look, uh, private schools, I'm afraid we can't do this as of yet. Let's hang on for a bit. Would that be out of place if they were to say that? Well, I mean, um, would that be out of place? It might be out of place. And the only reason is that, I mean, private schools are very, very private without any subvention of any kind or grants from government. So, I mean, for that reason, it will be out of place. However, from the legislative side of things, I mean, government will then need to rise and sort of give some kind of support to private schools to ensure that they remain viable. Because, I mean, right now what is happening is, of course, that government is using, um, the, I mean, legislating based on the fact that they are unable to ensure, I mean, to fulfill even their own guidelines. They are unable to fulfill their guidelines. And that's probably why they're saying, no, all schools should, should remain shut. But, of course, I mean, I believe, you know, personally anyway, that um, the time, Times are still difficult, they're still challenging, and I really don't think both private or even public schools should open right now. Well, there is a challenge that I, I believe you probably know about, the clamor, uh, how severely this pandemic, this arm pass that we have, so to speak, on our hands, uh, has affected private school teachers. You're a private educator. Uh, how, what's your take on all of that clamor, on all that is going on, especially as it affects private school teachers? Well, I mean, I, I expect that government should come in to support private schools. That is the right thing to do. I mean, just like the um, aviation industry, private schools have been adversely affected by this pandemic. And so for the first time, thank God, after a lot of um, letter writing and um, uh, advocacy, I would say, for the first time, I mean, private education has been included in being eligible, eligible for the stimulus package. Even though we've heard that, I mean, it's there, but anyway, we don't have any, the details of how this can be accessed. It is important that private schools, private school teachers are 
supported. But it also seems, unfortunately, that government doesn't have a process whereby to ascertain that, okay, these are the private schools or these are the teachers that are affected and these teachers should get some kind of stimulus package. For instance, I mean, I mean, and, and this is not rocket science. These teachers over the over a period of time would have been paying taxes. That we go through tax records and you know seek out teachers from there, you know, and pay them something, give them something to live on. You know, I mean, government just needs to rise up to its responsibility and do something for the citizens. But who, you, you would also over recall, the period of just time, one moment, madam. You would also recall that uh, the Minister of State had recommended that, uh, you know, the private schools should approach the CBN or some authorities through the TRCN, the Teachers Registration Council of Nigeria. I don't know if you'd think that would be sufficient to at least begin the conversation of the assistance from government. No, I mean, I'm saying that, you know, the... the, the um the committee headed by the vice, I mean, by the VP, you know, has already stated that government, I mean, that private schools are entitled to something. But how that process would be is not quite clear. I'm hearing of this TRCN thing for the first time. That is, we should approach the TRCN, you know, I mean, for, for, for that to happen. Well, maybe we will we, we'll explore that. But I think there are easier ways of, I mean, ensuring that this package gets to as many people as possible. I mean, why go to through TRCN? I mean, you have the records of these schools. You have the, two, I mean, the, 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 the tax records. You have their account numbers and things like that. It is a very simple process. I mean, which has happened in other climes. We just need to ensure that the data that we already have, we start using it for the purpose, you know, I mean, of supporting citizens. We will explore right, so, that if that, I don't I didn't hear that, so, I mean, yeah. Okay, well, we'll come back and uh, take a look at some other components of all of this question about reopening and then the COVID-19 protocol in just a moment. Do stay with us. Is in 10 parts the introductions, the foreword, and everything, but at, at the chapter 6, where we deal with the steps that need to be taken for schools and other learning institutions to be safe enough to open. And if they open, what they must do to stay open and how they will proceed with that process. We are willing to share the document, um, Chairman, right? Yeah. Okay. The Chairman uh, says the PTF is now willing to share the document. They've uh, assessed all of it because in its preparation, the NCDC, the WHO, and everybody has given their guidance. So it will be some sort of document. Uh, like I said, it's a 52-page document, and I would think it may be nice for you to get copies. Then you can... Um, help us X-ray Okay, welcome back. It's uh, our concluding moments now on this question as to modalities for schools reopening. Yes, um, Prof. Let me, let me bring this to you. Um, one uh, school owner, you know, told one of us uh, colleagues that uh, many parents are refusing to pay for the online classes. <laughs> you know? And of course, this is affecting the ability of the schools to pay the teachers. Um, you know, there are those who also see that there could be a real danger, uh, what we would call an epidemic of teachers or shortage of um, teachers after all of this pandemic is over. Okay, uh, Idris Shea, who said on Twitter, that on-site opening may not be the right way to go. But even if classes are to hold online, not all the teachers will be engaged in the teaching. So government should find a way to support private schools, especially the staff, because they also have families to feed. Well, uh, I know it's a cocktail. So. It, it is. No, uh, look, let's, let's put it this way. Uh, just as the last speaker also said, mm. there is need to support teachers across board. 
whether you are private or public. But let's be very careful here. Well, I, I was told, by the way, that public school teachers still get paid. They get paid? Yes. Yes, I understand that. Yes. But the question is, we're asking the government also to uh, provide for or to support private teachers. It's, it's a moral thing to do. But when you look at the business flip side of it, what stops private schools from charging for online resources, online teaching, as they were charging? In other climbs uh, some of, that some of us are familiar with, private schools are still charging today for online courses, what they were charging their students before the COVID started. So would that be one way of private schools in Nigeria going? Would that be a model that would be attractive to them? Because at the end of the day, you can't, you are, you are a private establishment. If on the one hand you are saying you do not want to agree with the federal government when it says, I'm not going to present you for why, you say, no, we are private, we are so private. If you are so private, then it calls into question why you are running back to the same government. Look, the burden and the benefit of anything go hand in hand, as we say in law. So it's very, very important to bear that in mind. But having said that, look, it's a, it's a moral dilemma here, even for the federal government. Because uh, if teachers are well remunerated, uh, uh, some of these issues will not even arise in the first place. If you have good packages for them. Then number two, you talk about online facilities. I was talking about public schools and online facilities. Some of these schools don't even have electricity. They don't have computers. They don't have laptops. They don't have anything. So, and what I heard say over and over is about private school, private school. We keep forgetting that it's not only private schools yeah. that we have in Nigeria, for goodness sake. Who speaks for public schools in this country? Online for who? There is, there is a community of school in a, what they call Ajegunle. They call them Tolu. Maybe we know about the Tolu complex. They have about seven schools inside that particular compound. Thousands and thousands of students. So we're talking about online facilities. You no, know, we can sit here and imagine this fantastic online has been available to everybody. Many houses, many homes don't have electricity supply. Many of, we have many parents who are earning how much? A month, 30,000 naira, 25,000. So, some are still earning 18,000 naira. And they have kids in school. So how are they going to be able to pay for all this? So I think we should, we should be very careful not to railroad ourselves into thinking only private when we are talking about all these you know, facilities. All right, Mr. Swerke, could, could you tell us then, give us your impression about you know, how this payment dynamics will work out in the light of the realities that uh, Prof just painted? Well, I mean... I do, I do agree that, you know, I mean, most schools are, private schools are teaching online and they're expected, I mean, we expect that parents should pay for this service. But unfortunately, there's a challenge there. Quite a number of parents are not paying up across board. Quite a number of them. And I wonder why. I mean, could it be, I mean, a Nigerian thing where people really don't like paying for services? I mean, we're just appealing to the parents that they should pay because schools are doing all they can do. I mean, those that can go online using Zoom and all of that to teach are doing that. Those, I mean, there's some people that actually even use WhatsApp to aid teaching and learning. That is going on. And these are the ways in which primarily teachers or schools will ensure that there is no learning gaps. We don't know how long this is going to go on for, you know, this pandemic or this sort of lockdown, as it were, will go on for. And so it is the responsibility of educators to ensure that, you know, I mean, children continue to learn. Now we expect that government at the same time should intervene because most of the children that are in school in Nigeria are actually in private schools of different cadres. And so you find that if all private schools, for instance, go into distress and shut down, governments will have a big, big problem on their hands. I mean, they will not be able to cope both with the infrastructural requirements of ensuring that children are, all children are in school. I mean, I'm even talking just about the children that are in school presently. I'm not talking about out of school children. And so it is imperative that there should be a level of support for, you know, for private schools. Furthermore, I mean, if we're talking about developing this nation, the fundamentals of development, you know, starts with educating, educa educating the children. And so both, I mean, and now, now I'm not even separating the private schools from the public schools. All the children in this nation deserve to be educated to ensure that this nation 
you know, steps back to the path of, I mean, development. Because without education, that will not happen. Well, you know, concerning the support, some sort of support from government to those private schools, I mean, proprietors are still asking. Uh, they want something in the region of maybe single digit interest rate between three to five percent. Now, if that were to happen, if government were to oblige them, how will this impact on the challenge you painted about parents or people not paying for facilities or learning facilities online? Would that justify free, continuous free learning if government were to come in and support? No, I mean, you, I mean, Presently, those schools are very, very private, supported privately, funded privately, and schools generally, private schools that is, are funded through fee payment. And so once this fee payment ceases, then the whole ecosystem is in jeopardy. The, 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 the teachers can't be paid. And remember that within a school system, it's not just the teachers that are there. When you have a school, you have administration staff you have you have all sorts of you know i mean the ecosystem con, you know consists of many different levels you know of um, employees and so if those employees are going to be sustained over this period then that support is required and is needed well so far we have been talking about the process of educating um students in schools how about the operation itself, the education itself? From where you sit as, uh, uh, in, in, the, in the sector, what do you see as opportunities that we can take advantage of in this uh, pandemic, so to speak? I mean, we hear that a pandemic such as this is an opportunity. On the one hand, uh, we're talking about infrastructure. On the other hand, we're talking about the fact that the academic year, ha the academic calendar has been gravely affected. So what are the opportunities that you, you think are here for us? And if schools must reopen when the time comes, what are the things that you see as being crucial that needs to be done so that we can you know, learn from this and do better going forward? Well, I mean, <laughs> first, it's an opportunity. It has given us an opportunity to just see ourselves as we are, the education system in this nation as is. And we can see that, look, we are really in deep trouble. And if any good is going to come out of this, we need to awaken. I mean, everybody really, I mean, government and everybody within all citizens, I mean, um, um, companies and organizations, because at the end of the day, the products of schools will work in organizations, in the industries, and things like that. We all need to work together to ensure that we support and build, you know, a viable educational system. The system, I'm sorry to say, I think is broken, and we just need to start um, working at it. I and mean, presently in Lagos State, a lot of work is going on, you know, private, I mean, in the public school arena to ensure that, you know, I mean, <laughs> Some of the broken pieces are put together, but a whole lot of work still needs to be done. And so from here, we need to, 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 to bring in all the all stakeholders and for us to I mean, start rebuilding, putting back the building blocks in place to ensure that the children are educated. I'm not sure, I mean, how many children, you know, from the public schools, for instance, will be able to go back to school after this um, lockdown, you know? I'm not sure, I'm not sure. But then what we, we, we need to start thinking of what we can do to ensure that we get all these children back into school and to ensure that actually education happens in school. I mean, and it's not just about online teaching. I mean, there's been, I mean, lessons are being conducted via radio, via the TV. Well, I mean, that, that, that's, that's working to some extent. We need to think of other avenues because, I mean, the cost online means spending extra money on data, obviously. Well, uh, if I could take it from there, and just one more thing as we wind down on, on this particular focus. Are private schools expected to charge the same fee from parents online? 
Well, I mean, I would expect that, I mean, they, they, they're supposed to, to charge a fee, I mean, that is commensurate to what they're doing. Yes, why not? I mean, yes, if, if, if what they're getting is um, of the same value, they can't charge the same fee. But I think even in, from that perspective, um, government has sort of intervened in a way, you know, and um, I would say supported parents, I mean... <laughs> You know, I mean, and uh, in a way that um, schools cannot possibly charge a, a certain fee. But anyway, I mean that, that that's neither here nor there. But the important thing is that a fee has to be charged, and parents need to pay for the service that they are receiving. What well, What do you think about this, Prof? Well, thanks. I, I <clears throat> parents should pay for online, but I don't think they should pay the same amount of money that they were paying for on-site. Simply because when you go online, teachers are not going to be transporting themselves to school. So the amount of money they spend on transportation, on commuting, on buying fuel, those of them who have kids who have to hire a nanny when they are away in school, all those uh, kind of expenditures, uh, expenses, beg your pardon, will be saved. So I wouldn't expect parents will still be paying the same thing. However, they should pay something reasonable, maybe 60%. Or so it's a kind of also a, a, a kind of gesture that you have, you have your kids here, you are paying 100,000 Naira before, but because of it, oh, it's online now, you're going to be paying 60,000 Naira. And that should reasonably compensate for teachers in the private schools. Because once they have that income coming in, then the schools have no business saying that they cannot pay their teachers. So the, the, the burden that is going to be shifted to the federal government in terms of supporting them mm -hmm. will be much more reduced than when they don't pay. That is when the parents don't Assuming pay. the government uh, accepts that burden. Assuming. Should shoulder it. <laughs> a big assumption. Because so. I, was, I was actually going to say, I mean, would you think the 40% remaining would be sufficient to cover the nanny costs, generator costs, data costs? Well, not necessarily. Look, uh, let's, let's put it aside. We, we, talk, we focus on education here. There is a panel player of sectors that, has, that is affected across mm. border. You don't even get anything. Mm. Look, some of us are in private sector. We're in private. We don't even get anything at all. So what we are saying is that, look, it's, it, let's be cliche about it. Have a loaf is better than nothing. If you're a teacher, you are earning 100,000 Naira per month, I'm just saying for you know, private school, before pandemic. And after the, during the pandemic, you, you, I'm, I'm going to be paying 60,000 Naira to teach me from home. Mm. Necessarily, you know, you cannot say you want to be taking 100,000 Naira when you're only teaching my kids online. Okay. All right, so there you go. Uh, Hadamala Bass is a professor of international law and global affairs expert. We'll also have had uh, Mrs. Lai Koiki, who is the chairman, Association of Nigeria's Private Educators, as private educators in Nigeria. Thank you both for talking to us today on the program. Well, your the tweets are still coming in, but uh, we will be back in a moment and focus on another matter. Stay with us.
Welcome back. Yes, indeed. Uh, well, that subject matter still hugging the headlines. As a matter of fact, uh, it was reported, um, if you saw some of the dailies today, it says day six. And panel quizzes Magu. And this time they say 700 million naira training fund. So that and several other matters. It just keeps happening quick and fast. Well, now we've got uh, Honorable Dio Bush, Alibi who was the pioneer chairman, subcommittee on EFCC. Thank you for coming on this morning. Thank you for having me. And then we also do have Mr. Kenneth Odedeka, who is a legal practitioner. He'll be joining us via Zoom today as well. Thank you for standing by, Mr. Odedeka, but we'll come to you in a moment. But Mr. Bush, um, while you chaired the subcommittee on EFC, at EFCC at the time, did it ever occur to you any time whatsoever that perhaps in the future that, uh, look, if certain things weren't done, we may be grappling with this kind of situation with the commission? Um, we always, um, the committee then always had um, its reservations as, regarding, as regards certain parts then. Um, but when you look at um, the EFCC itself, uh, the act that sets it up, you'd find out that uh, there's, there's a lot on, on, on the plate of the EFCC. And uh, when you look at the EFCC as well from inception, you discover that every chairman of the EFCC has had one issue of, or mm -hmm. the other. Um, Ribadu, no, Ribadu had his, his issues. If you remember then, I, th I believe um, he, at the end of the day, he was even demoted, if I remember, saying that he had been mistakenly... Um, uh, um, promoted. And prior to that time, the then president, Olusha Gwambasajo, had said uh, that um, uh, he had done very well and that uh, that was the reason why um, he had uh, go gotten that rapid uh, promotion then. <laughs> and when the police service commission came in after and said, oh, he was promoted in error, I thought after receiving so much um, uh, look at how Farida Waziri left, look at how uh, Lamode left, and uh, of course, we're, we're here with, uh, with, uh, with Magu. So, yeah. so what, what do you make of this then, all of this as it's playing itself out? Well, it's an inquiry. Definitely, as the chairman, uh, as the pioneer chairman then, we had several uh, petitions against the EFCC, you know, uh, people but feeling they were... The person or the oppression of the EFCC? About the, about the EFCC itself. Oh, okay. And of course, um, we, we're still dealing with this issue of um, uh, when you look at the era, we don't, EFCC is not seen as an institution yet. Mm. You see it as the era of um, uh, Nohu Ribadu, the era of Farida Aziri, the era of, you know, so it's, 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 it's tied to each era. Which brings up the question of uh, the, that succession. Correct. I have actually been concerned, as you are, mm -hmm. about the fact that each uh, leadership, well, the top person at the EFCC has always had to live in controversial circumstances. Mm -hmm. Is that a concern for you? Um, a bit of yes and a bit of no. I, I, I would say that, like I said, um, what were the reasons for them to have left? And you would find out at every time, at every time we entertained petitions upon petitions against the EFCC, particularly the heads of those, uh, uh, those heads of the, of the, um, the EFCC in itself. Um, either some people feeling that um, uh, they have been unduly treated. Uh, there was an issue then where some had even felt um, the, whenever they were going to effect arrests, uh, that they were already convicted before the public eye because uh, mm -hmm. they would go with the press, they lead them out in handcuffs. And, of course, that image remains in your head, mm -hmm. um, in the head of the people watching. So that's kind of affected things. Mm -hmm. All right. All now, right. let me be good, Mr. Didika, and pardon me. Uh, Mr. Didika, for, from what we see uh, today, they say, well, uh, panel others, Magos offices in uh, Lagos, Abuja, locked up. 18 of his aides also locked up out of their offices, bulletproof, three bulletproof SUVs recovered from him, panel arrest operatives of states. So, look, given the history of, the, uh, well, of Mr. Magu, uh, because I think somebody else is uh, on that seat at the moment, did you think, did you ever think that, look, having seen how things have played out about his confirmation 
Uh, and now, did you think that we were going to get to this point where we'll be grappling with dealing with this kind of inquiry, unearthing these things about his position at any time whatsoever? Good morning. <coughs> Good morning and thank you. Oh, definitely. You see, when there is illegality and something is hoisted or foisted and illegality, this is what you will get. I remember stating very clearly that the law that provides that a magu ought to be cleared by the Senate, confirmed by the Senate, have been breached. Yes, when the Senate did not confirm magu, what ought to have happened was that another president ought to have been sent to, to uh, uh, the Senate for confirmation. Now having sent magu and are retaining him to continue running as uh, acting as uh, ESC chairman, made a nonsense of the law. Because what was the purpose of sending him for confirmation in the first place if he didn't need that confirmation? So because of the fact that he was being sustained by illegality, then he had to be uh, have allegiance to the forces that were sustaining him and would do only those things that please those people. And when you act like that, when you, you, you owe such allegiance, you cannot work for Nigeria or for the country. You can only work for certain interests. So if... Well, the law still says that you're, you're innocent until proven guilty. Yes, All but Mr. Liga, apologies to jump in, but we need to go to break. We'll come back to you when we return, and so you can conclude your thoughts in just a moment. Please stay with us. Welcome back. Mr. Tidika, you're making a point about uh, illegality, his confirmation at the time, whether or not somebody else should have been represented. But at that particular time, in that context, there was a reason why the president stood by him. So it was expected, it was believed to be above board. The president, at least to that extent, the information he had on him. So would it then be fair or justified to say, well, because of that, this is why we are where we are today? Well, what's the connection? It should, be, it should not be correct to say that uh, that was all the information the president had. Because the DSS report, which was sent to the Senate, which the Senate, I think the president then read on the floor of the Senate, was available to the president, because it was available to us, the public. So that it wouldn't be correct to say that the information the president had at, of, of Mago at that time showed he was above board. I'm not saying he wasn't, but that's not the information we all had. We had information that he wasn't above board. He might have been, I don't know. But the information was that he wasn't. Now, if I am not above board, and if I'm being sustained by certain forces, I would necessarily pander to the interest of those forces. That is already corruption on its own. And if I believe that the forces that are sustaining me are such that are very strong, I will become reckless and do things I want to do. Not because the law says so, but because that's what I want to do. Or that's could what you, my principle. Could you get some light on this? Pardon me, because when you say forces that put him there, which forces could this be? Uh, could it be, are they over and above the president who submitted his name at the time for clarification? You know, what problem we have now is um, we have issues that are in the public domain, and you expect some authoritative stance by the president, not the presidency. You never, you never get that. So when Magus then was sent ostensibly by the president, and the Senate said, no, we won't, we won't confirm this gentleman. And he wasn't replaced, but was not meant to be acting, in my opinion, unlawfully till when it was now removed last week. Some people, some persons, some forces, maybe the president was <laughs> the main force, but some forces definitely were sustaining Magus' stay in office. And those forces apparently were, were, would appear to be quite strong because nobody could touch him and he could do whatever he liked. Now that these things are unraveling, we've seen that things are not how some people thought them to be. Some of us have said then that he was incapable of running EFCC for several reasons, including the one I've just said now. 
Because Let me bring Mr. Dyer on this law, one. With the law. Okay. Well, well, I haven't had that. And then speaking about capacity, his capacity to perform. Well, uh, I'm not sure that uh, they expected, uh, having presented his name, if you stood by him at the time, you certainly wouldn't expect to hear these kind of things, mm -hmm. uh, as it were. So one wonders how... Um, were you able to distinguish between what he says about the president and the presidency? Um, first of all, it's important for us to understand that what's going on right now is an inquiry. Mm -hmm. um, to, to, to find, and where he would have to answer certain questions. Yeah. Of course, some things would have made the presidency, in quote now, uncomfortable for that, that committee to have been set up to say, I need you to look into this. Now, is it true that... Um, uh, I remember it was uh, Dino Melai who stood up on the floor of the Senate then and read out a report. But let's not forget that at that particular time, there was a lot of politicking going on at the time where there ought to have been the business of governance happening. Now, um, I, to be fair to the DSS, we need to, uh, you know, total respect to the DSS, but we also need to understand that there were some people in the National Assembly at certain times. There was a case where it was, I'm not sure which IG of police uh, it was who went to the National Assembly and said there are some people he had even convicted who were members of the National Assembly. Mm, and I think he gets a senator who was in uh, the police. Exactly. Like police and office. you go through, see, don't forget that for you to be a member of the National Assembly or to hold public office, you would have had to go through screening. But then people, some people wondered then that, wait a minute, how come the DSS missed those people but were able to get um, <laughs> all the necessary information on Magu? Now, the only person who can actually answer the reason to have stuck by Magu would be the president himself. Mm. But as a leader, as a leader in leadership, when you present somebody, you would have done your homework on that person. Mm. And you would have a reason for appointing that person to think, I believe this is somebody who can actually fight that case of corruption, especially at the point where um, coming in, something that was, one thing that was sold to the Nigerian public mm. was that President Buhari was going to fight corruption. If the same president who had stood by him then now, uh, then rather, now sees that, wait a minute, I'm uncomfortable with certain things, and decides, let's give him fair hearing. I want you to conduct an inquiry first. I, I don't think there okay. should be an issue there. But you also heard him say uh, uh, that there's some, it was illegal for the man to remain in office while not confirmed by the Senate. As though I'm not a lawyer, but if it was illegal, this is Nigeria. A lot of Nigerians would go, a lot of Nigerian lawyers would have gone to court for free to say this is illegal. The, do you know how many cases we read about saying some lawyers approached the courts? How come no lawyer had approached the courts based on the illegality? So it makes you question if truly <laughs> there was any legal Something being not morally accepted, rather, does not make it legally wrong. Perhaps what the, the argument would be, the Act, the EFCC Act provides that the Senate ought to confirm Correct. The chairman, but mm -hmm. if this, and so if the, the the Senate didn't confirm the chairman, then you know he's probably not supposed to be the act. Where the act, the the constitution <laughs> empowers the president, gives the president certain rights, and where one where the act, um, I I don't want to say offend. I don't want to use the word offend. Um, where the act kind of tackles. Um, the Constitution would have to take precedence. So yes, if, the, if the president is allowed to have, the question is, did he break any laws? If he had broken laws, definitely a lot of people would but have risen up then. Speaking about the man himself, Mr. Magu, yes. why would you want to act? Because if this hadn't happened, he would have remained acting chairman mm -hmm. for five years. I mean, we know in some other claims, if they present you once, twice, and they're not even, and you perceive something is amiss, they're not comfortable with confirming you in spite of what integrity or what track record you might have had, in spite of the president backing you, shouldn't you as a president say, you know what, if they have questions, if they won't, Mr. President, honorably, I resign from this position. But he's been acting for five years. Um, 
if we're talking about honor, we need to look at um, precedence. How many people, what is the precedence? What's the benchmark for precedence so has been, I mean, in public service so far? Somebody has to start it. Well, maybe, he, now. maybe he chose not to start it. Okay, but, but as it is now, <laughs> he knew that being in that position, you cannot afford to have skeletons in your cupboard. Oh, absolutely. And look at all we're reading. Who would have thought that you'd be reading about all of these kind of things? So it's shocking to a lot of people. Well, absolutely. Well, um, if you have to start from somewhere, let's see how it goes. Mm. But one thing I'm certain about is for there to be respect for the rule of law, mm. there has to okay. be trust for the rule of law. And speaking about the rule of law, let's bring back Mr. Didica on this one. Look, for, for, do you think that the government you know, can have something from the point of law here, particularly when they say they're relying on the Tribunals of Inquiry Act? Can they get somewhere with this based on that act? So this is not the first time we're having things like this. The problem with Nigeria is that we always we, we always hide our heads in the sand and pretend that nothing is going amiss. Like uh, the person, you know, the honourable said, I I made my point clear and I made it at that time. One of those I tried to go to court for other, some other issues that the president found the states. They were. Okay, well, I'm afraid we lost him at that point. So, trying to make a point about going to court and things like that. Mm -hmm. But as it is now, the reason why we're asking about this is because part of that Tribunal's Inquiry Act was talking about look, whatever evidence you have here may not be used in the criminal proceedings. So, one wonders the powers, the limits, or functionality of this panel. They can't say he's guilty or otherwise. It's the courts that have the powers to do that. It, Absolutely. They can come up with recommendations. So, the next thing is. Is he, do you expect that he'll go before the courts and answer questions? Well, um, that would, be, that would uh, lie squarely on the, on the lap of the um, Attorney General and, of course, the ICPC. Hmm. Um, being the chairman of EFCC, where it's been, uh, what was, why was ICPC formed? Hmm. ICPC was formed to, to take on corrupt practices, official corrupt practices. And if he, being an official, of, uh, of government is found wanting, then ICPC can move in to say, well, now we're going to prosecute for reasons of corruption where he's been, where that has been established. Okay. Well, we'll have Mr. Dedeka back now. Could you please go ahead and conclude your thoughts? I was saying that the law must be respected. Otherwise, there's no purpose to it. Why, say, why have a law that won't be obeyed? Now, rule of law, rule of law. You start, the rule of law starts by the law being obeyed and implemented. Now, the, on, whether they go under the Tribunal Act or any other law for that matter, even if it's not a judicial panel of inquiry, they can find out exactly what, if Magu did anything wrong and the things he did wrong. But as usual, we are full of drama. I don't even see the need for the so called suspension. In my opinion, what would have happened would have been Magu should have been set aside and then him sent to Senate for confirmation. Then, Magu would have been investigated. And the findings now used to, to either put him on trial or let him go home. But no, we have to make all this noise, muddy the place up. I'm telling you right now that nothing will come out of this. Yes, well, Justice Ayo Salami is a respected jurist. However, ultimately, this is political. So whatever they find, or did not find, or do not find, sorry, will not amount to anything. This is not the first time, it's not going to be the last time. We are full of drama. All theory, no substance. What makes you, what makes you say that, Mr. Didika? Have you had the stories flying around? Not like designing is $20 billion. You see, when, when they started this, I'm, 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 I'm trying to moderate my words, but when they started this thing, I said it that, it was just a show. Ultimately, nobody's really going to jail. I, I don't mean Magus. I mean when, when Magus uh, became the EFC chairman. Mr. Rizika, don't, don't you think, don't you think that there's, there's an issue here? I mean, if you look at the previous chairman, uh, Nuhu Ribadu was removed under controversial circumstances. Uh, Farid Waziri was removed under controversial circumstances. Lamode was also, you know, removed under controversial circumstances. And this 
And just as you have said, it seemed like every allegation that came against every one of them, nothing you know, really came out of it. So don't you see a problem of a pattern here? You, you, you referenced the illegality the other time that it, the, Magu is having this problem because he was not confirmed by the Senate. But the same thing that happened to the previous chairman of the, of the, of the EFCC. All of them were confirmed, yet they, were, they also had similar circumstances. What do you think the problem is really? There are something else I talked about. I said about Nigeria. I said we're full of drama, fury, no circumstance. Those ones that were removed, they will all, they will, all of them will always be removed under, under such circumstance, always, because the office of the chairman of EFCC has been defined. He's a god. So as far as one guy is a god, seeking to do what to, what pleases him, even trampling the law in the process, being defended by lawyers. His actions being defended by prominent lawyers when he's doing it. Some of them are now with Mago personally now asking for for asking for bail and all that. Okay, one, one moment. People who if you say, Mister Dudika, one moment. If you say that the office of the chairman of the EFCC is deified, it presupposes then that there is too much power in the hands of the EFCC chairman. Are you calling for a review of the law? Oh, definitely, definitely. But anyway, that's another another forum. It is too powerful. It is, yes, it's executive chairman, but the, 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 excuse my French, the executiveness of that executive is too powerful. And being let, Nigeria, hmm. because, sorry, uh, let, let's let's uh, bring that same matter to um, Honorable fact, You know, there's also uh, a point similar to this one, where some are asking that, look, perhaps in context of reviewing the law, if at all the thing is worth the review, should we keep having a certain police person head the EFCC? I always had an issue with that because it, it, it boxes it in. It, um, it insists that, um, to a certain extent, if I remember well, it says that um, whoever will head the EFCC must be either a serving or a retired, um, should, have been, should be a, an acting, a, a serving or a retired um, security, uh, operative. security operative In of no less, hmm. no lower hmm. than the, the, the rank of an ACP. Which means that even at that point, they had used the police force as a benchmark. Now, I've always been, even as the chairman, I had spoken with my colleagues, then I had been comfortable, I've been uncomfortable with that clause. Um, I agree with, with, with the legal practice, Mr. Or, or did, or, or, uh, the legal practitioner on, 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 the other line, on the other end saying that there's need to review it. But when in Nigeria, in this climb, um, laws are meant to, to, to be domestic, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. um, international laws can't be, it, it, you know, they don't always work. So, so when you look at the, the, uh, the going zones, the peculiarity of your society, yeah. you would have to um, make available remedies that will actually cure the ailments. You know, so, some of those who argued, uh, made that point, supported it, thought that it was in the genealogy of the police to act. Maybe some, you know, uh, there's always a default mode that this kind of things happen. So would it be fair or should we then say, if you want to review, what should that review specify? Well, first of all, um, to talk about it being in the genealogy of the police, I, I would, uh, I mean, there's so many fine officers out there. But the question, the issue is, there's been this constant uh, talk about <laughs> looking at the process, reviewing the process through which they emerge as officers in the police force. So if, if that's faulty, it would definitely affect them serving you know, the route, if, where the route is faulty, it would affect them serving you know, somebody emerging as the chairman of EFCC. So what you need to put in place would be checks, and not to take away the powers, but to put in place checks and balances to make sure that um, the same way you have the, the office of, of the president is very powerful, very powerful in Nigeria or in any clan. However, you have checks and balances in place uh, 
through through the other arms of government. Okay. Mr. Dudika, a quick one before we go. We're winding down. If there were to be a review, who, what caliber of person would you like to see head that position? A very intelligent, educated, enlightened person with deep knowledge of um, how security agencies actually work. Somebody who have undergone such training and... Matter if he's a police officer. Somebody who has... Doesn't have to be a police officer at all. Does not have to be a police officer. Could be, but doesn't have to be. And in any case, even if you're a police officer, not a serving police officer. Okay. Well, gentlemen, we'll have to thank you both for talking to us on this matter. It's a matter that is unfolding. It's not going to... Yeah, it's still a panel. Uh, we don't know what happens if there will be recommendations and what happens thereafter. Mm -hmm. But we do thank you all, uh, Mr. Dayo Bushalebi Oshu, former chairman subcommittee on the AFCC, as well as Mr. Kenneth Odidika, a legal practitioner. We're well, back in a moment to look at what you are saying in just a moment. Don't go away.
welcome back. Let's look at uh, what you are talking about this time. We've got this one from, uh, he says, is uh, Kulenki One. He says, um, it is not easy for private school teachers in this era of pandemic. If there is need to continue to close school, these set of people should be considered. Sapoli says, my children's school imposed an online learning school fee of 120,000 naira each during the lockdown without even holding a discussion with the parents. The normal school fee is 160,000 naira. Of course I refuse to bend to their exploitation. From 160 to 120? <laughs> <laughs> well, it is uh, exploitation because it's sitting at home. Uh, but Sissi Eko says, I laughed so hard when a lady said she refused to pay and told them she was no longer interested in the online classes after they charged her so much money for her kid who barely sits for the online classes. Poor kids are obviously not part of this. No device, no internet, disappointed, but relieved face. Or send you read one says reopening school is the best option because the virtual classes is not effective because our educational system is not built in that direction, which makes it difficult for the schools to participate in virtual classes. So maybe he says it's not the best option. Or maybe mentally it's not the best option. No, I think what he's saying is that our, the entire structure is not built for virtual learning. Uh, yeah, that's why it's, it's, yeah. it's not effective. So reopening schools will be the only way to go for him, you know. But then if you oh, look at okay. that... Oh, okay, reopening schools will be the best yeah. option. I get you now. If you look All at right. that 52-page that guideline, has, that six, page, chapter 6 that the Minister of State talked about made some recommendations. I don't know how they work, though. This one, Atoyebi says, online classes can never be a substitute for physical classes. These kids can't comprehend age factor. What are the performance indicators for kids you do see? <laughs> Who monitors their exams when their parents or guardians can easily help them do the exams? <laughs> well, sometimes, you know, maybe the focus shouldn't be on exams, but for learning for the children. And I think that there, there is some measurable way to check that. And maybe that also boils down to, you know, the sort of educational system which we already run. But take a look at what Onu is saying. He says, have you imagined the double cost of such an endeavor? Will the school provide parents with the needed data after exorbitant charges as fees? The parents still grapple with the cost of data, and you know what that means in Nigeria. Mm. All right, so Valentine thinks he thinks somebody else should head the police office, not the AFCC. All right, so there you go. Uh, that's the show today. We we'll thank you all for your comments. We'll see you again tomorrow. I'm Chamberlain Uso. I'm Ayo Makide. Do stay safe. Be responsible out there. Thank you for watching and thank you for your comments. I'm Mao Yusuf. <laughs>